so let me move forward. Anyways, it's a great opportunity to like talk about this. Um, before we jump in, I just wanted to give a bit of context. Uh, I've seen some familiar names in chat. Some are less familiar. So my name is Alex, Alex McMillan. I'm actually using, this is a LinkedIn QR code. Super happy to connect with anybody. I'm a VP product at Social Point, which is a mobile game developer in Barcelona. And uh, I've written a few things about product management, analytics, monetization, and mobile games in general. Uh, so I have a blog. And actually, I wrote previously uh, on the Iron Source uh, blog about uh, the Battle Pass. So today's presentation is going to be going into that a little bit. Uh, I actually have worked with Battle Passes, like on some of the titles I've worked on. Today, it's really more going to be about how to think about it, what kind of questions are relevant, and how maybe you could use that way of thinking to help you navigate through. Just for the record, uh, I'm here, like this is why I'm, why I'm gonna say it doesn't reflect a social point or take to uh, the opinion about battle passes monetization. And there's no really hard data like you guys just did. It's really just me saying how we've thought about it, kind of the stuff we've been working on, and uh, hopefully it could be useful for you guys as well, you guys and girls. So today's presentation is really gonna be broken down into three different points. I'm gonna talk very quickly about what the defining features of a battle pass are, in my opinion. I'm gonna discuss why I think it's a great monetization feature. So maybe approaching it in a different way than you guys did or Jeff will, I'm really considering this as a monetization feature and seeing how it works and why it works so well in most of the titles. And finally, the final part of this talk is gonna be suggesting ways you could look at the battle pass to optimize your battle pass performance. And here I'm mentioning really performance as in uh, monetization performance, you know. I am gonna to try to keep it short, uh, so we'll have time for Q and A at the end. And if not, super happy to follow up uh, on this. So jumping into the battle pass itself. So Fortnite is not the first one to have implemented the battle pass but it's probably what I would consider like the first high impact, high visibility implementation of the battle pass. I think Fortnite in itself was an event that goes way beyond gaming, mobile gaming, gaming in general. Uh, and I think along with its huge success, it really uh, made the battle pass something much more standard. There have been quite a few very interesting implementations and iterations on the UI UX front. Um, this is one of the early battle pass. You had two very rigid blocks between the free and paid, free on top, paid at the bottom. Um, recently, they've switched to like a single line where basically they don't distinguish the free and paid as much. There's a little badge. And the last, well, I guess they started a new season yesterday, but the season two, uh, they had the linear one was maybe a different way to highlight free and paid. So these are actually pretty interesting uh, differences. The thing is, Ultimately, the format itself remained very standard. And I think Fortnite is really has been one of the main reasons why we're talking about the Battle Pass today and why we've seen it in so many different titles. One thing that was mentioned in the previous presentation was early on, especially, maybe a bit less now, Battle Pass was associated to cosmetics. Uh, there was a, initial talks were really, some of the conversations I was having, some of the stuff you could read would really insist on how the Battle Pass was a way to monetize cosmetics. This is something which is less and less evident at the moment, I guess. And partially this presentation is gonna be challenging that in some ways. So that was Fortnite. If you look at the market today, uh, you could see really battle passes everywhere. You have uh, the Clash of Clan and Clash Royale battle passes, uh, which uh, Joseph and Giovanni just spoke about. You also have Call of Duty Mobile, you have uh, PBZ3, which is in soft launch, uh, AFK Arena, FIFA, the list goes on and on, really. So it becomes some kind of standard feature, standard monetization feature, almost in the same way that Piggy Bank became a standard monetization feature two, three years back, you know. And I think it's pretty clear that moving forward, we're going to see more and more of those battle passes in the future in the industry. So what all these different examples show us, I think, is that battle passes are not about cosmetics. Some of the few examples I've given you feature either consumables or uh, in gotcha based games, some characters. Really, I think the battle pass is about engagement. 
and this is really, I think, what the great value of the battle pass is. And this is where I'm getting, trying to like elaborate today is the battle pass is a great way to monetize engagement. And I think this is why so many titles are seeing success with it. Maybe not at first, maybe it requires a bit of iterations. And because the battle pass is about engagement, that's the main reason why I believe it's such a great monetization feature. And it has been so successful in different contexts. If you just take a step back and think about monetization, when you think about what's driving monetization, ultimately your fans are the one monetizing. So that sounds redundant. It could sound very standard, but what that really means is that you don't make people spend, you don't make your players spend money in your game, really. Monetization is a way to capitalize on your fans engagement with the game. People spend in your game, not because it makes sense, not because they have to, not even because it's rational. It's really players who spend in your game are the ones who love your game and simply want to game use it more on different aspects. So what that means is that monetization is not about making players do something. It's not about making players spend money. Monetization is about finding ways to provide value to those fans who love your game and who just really want to engage with it on a very emotional and positive level. So why am I speaking about this when I'm talking about the battle pass? I've broken down the Fortnite battle pass in more details uh, in a different post. So I'd be, invite you to read it, I'd love to get some feedback. But if you were to like really summarize and focus on some of the very key aspects of the battle pass, the number one thing is that the battle pass as a monetization feature ties in rewards and engagement. The way it works is the more you play, the more you rewards you get. So you have a lot of different variations on this. Do you, is it simply, do you have to complete very specific challenges to get points to move forward? Is it simply getting XP leveling up, allows you to move through the battle pass? There are different ways how you can actually measure and reward that engagement. But the one key feature which you could find almost in its abstract form in all the battle passes out there is that the battle pass is a way to translate convert engagement into rewards. And this is why, as a starting point, it's really good because it's gonna help you double down on your fans who are playing your game, your fans who wanna engage with it even more, you're making it even more rewarding for them to do that. And that is really the starting point of the battle pass is able to tap into like that main dynamic, that main fundamental positive emotion that was gonna make people wanna spend in your game. The second point is that the battle pass there are probably a few exceptions, but overall, you always have two different routes. You have the free pass and the paid pass. So as, like, as you play, I'm gonna assume most of us are familiar with the format more or less. As you're gonna be playing, you're gonna be advancing nodes, you're gonna be advancing levels in the battle pass, and that's gonna allow you to get rewards. Whether you pay or not, there are some tier of rewards you're gonna be able to get. And this is where it's really great because the battle pass is going to having is going to provide you a way to get even more rewards. So basically, for same level of engagement, so same amount of games played, same amount of challenges completed. If I don't spend, I'll get X rewards, and if I do spend, I'll get many more rewards. They, those rewards can be exclusive. They can be consumable. It doesn't so much matter what the content of those rewards are, it's really a different way to monetize and reward even more engagement. Another very interesting aspect is that you could purchase it anytime. So that doesn't really necessarily sound something very unusual, but the interesting part is there are positive, I guess, and negative ways to monetize. And it's a common, not gonna say common, but it happens that some monetization features are gonna put time pressure on people if you don't spend with an X amount of time, you've lost that opportunity. The battle pass doesn't do that. If you've progressed 10 levels, you're gonna get those 10 levels worth of rewards, whether you buy it on day one or on day two or day 30. And I think this is very interesting because it shows how not only does the battle pass translate engagement into like rewards, not only does it make you monetize in a positive way to get more rewards with the same level of engagement, it's actually positive in the sense that you will always be able to benefit from the rewards you get from your engagement. So there's no punitive, there's no negative approach to monetization. There's no FOMO so much here. Uh, it's really just focus on engagement, 
give rewards to your engagement and don't take those rewards away. So that's really it. I think the battle pass is about monetization and it's about to capitalize on the engagement of your fans. The more you play, the more rewards you get. Spending makes your engagement more valuable and the accumulated benefits of engagement are never lost. So that right there, I think is something that's very uh, important to keep in mind. And this is why so many games, I think I've seen positive benefits because once you start thinking that monetization is not about making people do something, it's not about making people spend money. It's more about providing value to people who love your game. This is the best way, the very positive way to actually be providing that value and monetizing that engagement. So really, I think to me, the battle pass is a feature that monetizes engagement. And that's why it's so successful because ultimately monetization is about finding a way of capitalizing on engagement. So what, what does that mean? It means that it's a way to capitalize and monetize engagement. You could reinforce what I mean by the statement battle passes are not features that create engagement is if you're not engaged in the game, if you're not interested, if the game doesn't interest you, Having extra rewards is not going to change your opinion about the game. A bit, I don't know if this is the subtext between Joseph and Giovanni's talk previously, but the battle pass can't fix a broken economy, like in Clash Royale. In the same way, a battle pass cannot make an unengaged player engaged. But what the battle pass can do is that it could double down on people's engagement, passion, love for your game. And it could, find, it could actually monetize that. So that to me is something which is really good. And this is why I think a lot of the time, this is what makes the battle pass successful. So now that we have these very brief and uh, very simplified overview of what the battle pass is, how it monetizes and why it's an interesting monetization feature, the next step and the final part of this presentation I wanna talk about today is how can you actually improve a battle pass. If you have a battle pass in your own game, if you have a few different things, what are the kind of questions you could ask to optimize and improve your battle pass? What are different things you could do to avoid some pitfalls? And maybe how could you think about it in general to give it the right impetus, you know? I think one thing that's for sure is that you probably won't get it right the first time, maybe not even the second time, but if you have a good sense of what are the key metrics you need to be looking at? What are the key indicators that are relevant and meaningful? Then you're going to be in a much better position to actually make those changes and iterate pass after pass. You know? So one key question, and this is going to touch into like a question that was made a bit earlier on in the, in the early bird like networking event. The first question you should ask yourself is how can you get more players to buy on launch state? If you go back and think about monetization and engagement in general, chances are you could see that any feature you'd have, any offer you're gonna have, most people are gonna buy it, most people who will buy it, are gonna buy it as soon as it's launched. And the reason for that is, probably you're having a good offer, but also people who are spending money in your game are people who love your game and who are actually actively looking and hoping and expecting those offers. So the same happens with everything. The more engaged the player, the more they have a desire to engage and spend in your game. So as soon as your battle pass is launched, chances are that's when most of your like, purchases are gonna happen. If you wanna monetize even better and improve that, you need to be asking yourself, how do you get more players to buy on launch date? So a few things which you could see as best practices in existing games, even if you don't have a battle pass of your own to like validate that data, you could look at how other games do it and get some kind of sense of uh, this is the way to go. You want to make the purchase moment rewarding. On one hand, the battle pass is going to be monetizing engagement. On the other hand, if someone is actually spending money in your game, you need to make sure that there is an immediate gratification. Even before the first node, as soon as you buy it, you get rewards. In Fortnite, you're going to get some skins. In different games, you're going to get a bunch of boosts. Clash of Clans, I believe you also get like those passive boosts. Simply spending money is actually gonna give you part of the benefits. And that's really what you wanna be doing. You wanna make sure that if you want people to spend money, like from the first moment they buy it, it's rewarding. The other thing you need to be doing is you need to make the pass rewards valuable. 
And this ties into how are you going to want to look at the battle pass? If you want to see it as a monetization feature, it won't be the same thing as if you choose to see it as an engagement feature. By that, I mean, if you think that you're monetizing engagement, that you're monetizing people's positive emotions around your game, then you got to be asking yourself, should you be thinking about stuff you're giving away, how you're potentially cannibalizing something? That's probably an interesting panel for next time. Does cannibalization exist or not? But you got to be asking yourself, do you benefit from holding off? Do you benefit from not giving stuff to people who are engaged, who want to engage with your game? And if you want to get more players to buy your pass on launch day or later on, you need to make sure that you have valuable rewards, that you give stuff that people find meaningful and valuable. Again, this touches back what Joseph and Giovanni were talking about in their talk. One thing you could do to get players to buy it on launch day is to make sure there's some kind of time limited benefit. If you buy it on launch day, if you buy it on the first week, can you do something to make it even more beneficial for people to buy it then? Is it like a discount? Is it extra bonus? Whatever it may be. You know. So these are the kind of things you gotta be really thinking about. And obviously optimal prices, that applies to, I would say pretty much anything you put out there, you need to make sure you have the optimal price. And I think in this respect, the battle pass is not, it's maybe harder to A-B test like a battle pass price than any other offer you'd have, uh, but you would have ways to test from one pass to the next, et cetera. So obviously iterating, testing stuff out is gonna be key here. And why I also talk about optimal price because you wanna make sure that you get as many players as possible to buy on launch day, but you also gotta be asking yourself how to get more players to spend more, period. The battle pass, a big part of the battle pass, you're going to make money from people buying the battle pass. Depending on how your game is set up, that's the only way you might be monetizing it. So the one thing that's very interesting, and a lot of games are doing this, is like having different options for the price point, giving your players the option to spend more money in your game. In my experience, it's very rare to see this not being beneficial for you and the players. One example is Fortnite. And there's one among many where you could choose to buy the battle pass for a fixed price, or you could choose to buy the battle pass with a head start. So those are the key questions. How do you get more people to buy as soon as possible? And how do you get people to spend more? Some games also allow you to like actually purchase extra nodes. So you have different options in your disposal at your disposal to try to monetize the acquisition part and also the progression part. So that's it. The second thing that's really important is this might be counterintuitive if you think that the battle pass should be a challenge to be overcome is like, how can you make more players get to the end of the pass? So if you think the battle pass is an engagement feature, this is probably not a goal for you. You probably want to make sure that you're pushing players like hard, that you may be making them jump through hoops a bit. If you think about it as a monetization feature, you got to be thinking if your players are willing to spend money, and to give you money to engage with your game, to get your battle pass, do you actually really need to make it hard? And this is a question I'll talk about a bit later. But you need to be asking yourself, can you make more players get to the end of the pass? If you have milestones frequent enough, you could give that sense of progression. If people have to grind for like days and days to get from node 10 to 11, that's not very rewarding. That's not a great experience. That's not helping them stay in the loop, you know, so to speak. So that's one thing which is really important is you don't have to make it shorter, but can you put more milestones? So that touches it get what Giovanni was talking about, the depths of the economy. Can you give enough frequent rewards? Could be more or less meaningful, but simply giving that gratification is something you want to be aiming for to get people to the end of the pass. The other one, which is super important, and I can't stress that enough, is you want to make sure the final reward you have in your battle pass is going to be compelling enough to keep your fans motivated. That's the real carrot you want to put out there that's going to drive people to get to the end. Again, it's not going to make someone who's not interested in your game actually start playing it like crazy, get to the end. But those players who are a bit on the edge, you know, who are not sure, those players who like your game but who might not want to monetize or who are on the fence, that's going to help keep them engaged and drive them till the end of the pass. And this leads to like the interesting question. I think the fundamental question, and that has to do with whether or not you're considered, do you benefit from making it hard to complete the pass? 
Maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. But I would really invite you to try to find ways to like answer that question with actual data and not necessarily assumptions on what the past should or shouldn't do. The reason I'm saying that is because, A, do you monetize progression? Do you sell extra nodes? Some games do, some games don't. Some games monetize those extra nodes that you purchase. Is it actually relevant and meaningful for your, like, your bottom line? Maybe, maybe not. The other thing you got to keep in mind is, what is the potential revenue from non-buyers who complete the pass? If, when are people buying the pass the most? A lot, chances are in your battle pass, most people are going to buy the battle pass the day it's launched when they haven't progressed at all in it. But if you look at how many people are buying it when they get to the end, if you look at it from a relative point of view, you might see that, in fact, more people are willing to buy the pass when they get to the end. And if you think about it intuitively, that could make sense because once you've completed the pass as a non-buyer, that's the moment where you have the biggest bang for your buck. That's probably the most rewarding thing about the pass because there's no uncertainty. There's no questioning whether or not you're going to complete the pass. You've already completed it. And you know immediately right there that all the bonus, all the rewards you could get from the pass, you could obtain at that moment. So if you look at it, like you could probably get more revenue from those people if you get them to the end. And again, it comes back to thinking about in a positive or negative way. Regardless of the game you're working on, I'm willing to bet that you have a group of users who no matter what you give them or don't give them, they will never spend. And that's just the way, it's just the name of the game, almost, you know. We're getting people to download our games on the promise of free entertainment. So obviously, some people, no matter what you do, are not going to spend. And that's totally fine. The one thing you probably don't want to do is you probably don't want to base your monetization strategy on those, that segment of users, you know. So keeping this in mind, do you actually want to make it hard? The last thing you want to keep in mind, and this is the last point I'll, I'll finish on. I took a bit longer than expected, but we'll have an extra five minutes to, to chat. What is the repurchase rate of your buyers who complete the pass? You know, because you can think about the battle pass as a one-off thing, but the reality is it's not. Uh, Fortnite has seasons. A lot of games have a time-limited time window in which the pass is available. Some games don't, but a lot of games have some kind of temporality associated to the pass. And if you think about that, if you think that the pass is like a recurrent purchase, that's going to be a core aspect of your monetization, you got to be asking yourself, if I'm a buyer and I actually get to the end of the pass, are those people, are those players more uh, likely to purchase? This is something, if you have a battle pass, you could actually be asking yourself those questions. You could be looking at your own data and you could say, okay, are you actually benefiting from making it hard or do you actually benefit from giving it, making it easier? Keep in mind, the battle pass, if you choose to look at it as a monetization feature that monetizes an engagement, you want to make sure that that engagement is rewarded as much as possible. And if some people are getting more than they bargained for, I think you shouldn't be looking at that part. You should be looking at your engaged players, your fans. How are they engaging with the battle pass and how is that driving your monetization? So there are some key questions that I think are helpful and relevant. Obviously there are others and I think every game is different. But this is really, in my experience, how you could choose to look at the battle pass as a monetization feature and see how those aspects uh, can help you hopefully improve the monetization of your own battle pass. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. I think we have time for a few more questions, I guess. And happy, uh, happy to take it from there. So uh, Alex, looks like we've got a few questions that are coming in actually in chat. But you know, for anyone else out there, feel free to put in your question in the Q&A or in chat. But we have one from Henrich. How do you guys go about determining what the optimal battle pass price for a given game is? Kind of a question that also came in during the early networking phase, but do you have any thoughts on that? It, it's tough to say. And I, I would say in my experience, battle pass or no battle pass, the more expensive the price point, the better. Now, this doesn't mean you got to be some kind of like sleaze bag and just like make something expensive and not give value. And this is the great thing about the battle pass. I would encourage, try to find a, a price point high enough people are willing to spend and give enough stuff which makes it valuable and meaningful for players to buy. You see, I, would, I wouldn't approach things in like, what's inside the box? How much should I price it? It's like, start the other way around. What's the appropriate 
price point your engaged players are willing to spend? And what can you put inside the box to justify that price point? So uh, it's hard to say, it really depends on so much your pricing strategy, how things are going, but uh, I would focus on make it expensive and add enough value to make that expensive rather than make, make it stingy and make it cheap, you know? Right, but uh, Alex, from your perspective, you know, one of the, one of the ways that I view Battle Pass is a form of a sale. Uh, sure. Do you view it in, in similar terms or? <sighs> It depends on the game. And I think it depends. I know you, like, uh, we had a few con chats about consumable or not consumable. I think if you're thinking about battle pass as consumable, it's almost sky's the limit. You know, you got to make sure the economy has enough sinks, I guess, to, like, uh, use those consumables. But I, I don't necessarily think about it as a sale. You know, it's okay. more of a, of a way to pace your player's engagement and really accompany them as you play your game. Okay. How do you see the option to tie in a battle pass as a subscription versus single purchase? Well, I've heard that question quite a bit. I actually have no experience, direct experience, like dealing with subscriptions. So it's very hard to tell. I'm, it's, it's really hard to say, like, I'm more comfortable with the one-off purchase simply because like I said, A, I don't really have that experience. B, I think maybe historically subscriptions came up to solve a problem, which maybe doesn't apply to mobile gaming as much as it, it would for like companies like Netflix and so forth, you know? Um, so I, I'm not totally convinced by subscriptions in the mobile business yet. Okay. So and so I'm, I'm not, we're not going to have forward. time to answer all of the questions, but again, in a follow-up email, we'll try and address all of those, but just to hit a few more questions uh, from Varun uh, Ramachandran, what are your thoughts on duration of battle pass 30 or 60 days or, you know, how do you determine the, the duration? I mean, that's a great question. It, it, it's really hard to talk in, in general terms about stuff like that. In my experience, you could be surprised at how often players, your fans want to engage with Battle Pass. If you're releasing new content, if you're releasing consumables, it's maybe a different deal. But if you're releasing new content, stuff that's exclusive to the Battle Pass, uh, I think you'd be, ex you'd be surprised at how frequently people would be willing to bet it, to buy it, you know. So between 30 and 60, I would say like the more frequent, the better for you. It's just a matter of finding how can you make it valuable for your, your, your fans, you know. And I know, um, Troy, you, uh, you've got a comment for, for all panelists. Feel free, like if anyone in the audience has thoughts, feel free to chat to everybody. Uh, but in terms of the next question from Callum Cleary, if you want to increase your breadth of payers, what change in payer percentage has been seen in free-to-play games with a pass? So I guess he's asking case? in terms of conversion, like if, if, if for a, a certain game, let's say the, let, let's say your, your overall conversion is like, you know, 1% or 3% with a battle pass, you know, does that go up to 10% or 5%? I think that that's his question. I only have my own, like, I mean, obviously I don't have, this is not public information. So, I mean, it's hard for me to tell like uh, in general how that works. I think in general, really, this is probably gonna be more effective for people who are already engaged, kind of like touching on the points what I was mentioning before. The battle pass won't make someone who's not into your game, into your game, chances are. Uh, but it can make someone who's on the fence a bit, play a bit more, it can make someone who's spending, spend a bit more frequently. Uh, I think ultimately, this is really more of a feature, in my experience at least, to help you improve the way you monetize your existing fans more, rather than create more fans, you know? Okay, uh, one question. I, I don't quite understand this question, so may, maybe I can read it out and you can yeah. interpret it. From Benjamin de la Clemendier, mm -hmm. do you benefit from giving back the same amount of hard currency in the battle pass as its price, as in Fortnite, or should it be in real currency, as in Clash Royale? There's obviously no right answer for this. You know, in my experience, there can be a desire to be very, uh, very fancy, you know? And I think the battle pass where you give out more currency to players so they actually buy the next one, uh, I think it, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a feel good experience, I guess, you know? I don't know if you actually benefit from that as, uh, as a publisher, you know? The big thing we didn't talk about today is like, do you want it to be hard currency or IP directly? You have, you have both, you know? So, for example, if you're IP only, I would say it's not 
as difficult to like give out hard currency in the battle pass. If you're in this hard currency loop where you're giving out hard currency enough to buy the next one, then you got to be wondering what else are people willing to spend on, you know? Uh, I think, like I said, Fortnite, like Epic doesn't share too much info, too much data on how they do. Uh, so it's hard to say how it would impact it. Yeah. It's more, it's riskier, let's put it that way. Right, I, I think I've got a couple of data points. Let me ask if I can share that information. And if I do share it, it'll, it'll come in that follow-up email. Uh, but going on to another question from Sahana HS, is it bad if almost 50% of users complete the battle pass in half the time, like for a 30 day pass, 50% completed in 15 days? As you mentioned, it's an engagement feature. Should it be made in such a way that people find it hard to complete and use all 30 days? Yeah. I, it's a new position for me because I'm talking about it, like a bunch of stuff. Like I, I don't really know like what game someone is working on, so it's hard for me to tell. I mean, I guess the first question, is it bad if people complete the past to begin with, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, well then, probably the question is not about the pacing of it, you know. If it's not bad that people get all the rewards, you gotta be asking yourself, is it hurting you if they're getting it early? Because if you think 50%, like, it's like the long tail always, like if 50% are completing the, the pass in 50, in 30 days, okay, is that like 30 day pass? Okay, so if, let's say 50%, of your players are going to complete the 30 day pass in 15 days. You know that there's a long, that remain 50% is going to take them a long time. Maybe 10, 20% are going to get to the end. So that super engaged group of players, you're probably not hurting yourself if you're giving them value and if it making it rewarding for them to play your game. You probably want to be thinking about the remaining 50%. How many of those remaining are going to get to the end in 30 days? Because if you balance your game on your top 5% to complete it, like in 30 days, that means 95% of your people are not going to get it. So it's really the name of the game is you're going to have such a wide distribution of players between your most engaged and your least engaged. You got to like decide where is the appropriate, where's the relevant audience to complete in 30 days. And I would say 50% is probably not it. So I wouldn't be worried about that. Uh, again, this is me not even knowing what game we're talking about and speaking in general terms, but uh, another question to decide the price point for battle pass. You said AB testing is not the best way. Any other suggestions on how to test this out or how to determine yeah. the? Well, when I say it's not the best way, is I haven't found I haven't found the best way to, make, to AB test it. So <laughs> I, would, I would encourage you to try it out and let me know. All right, uh, anyone in the audience have a good way? Just put it into the comment into the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll try it out. Uh, I, I I think. Our players are usually more resilient than we tend to think about it. You know, we tend to think about like, we're gonna break stuff in an irreversible way if we do this or that. It's usually not the case. Right. So I just say like, be bold and like, I mean, just try from one pass to the next, like try changing the pass. You could try it at eight bucks, 10 bucks one day and 20 bucks the next pass. It's not the end of the world, you know? And I think often we might be tempted to think that these changes are gonna have like, I, like uh, an effect which we won't be able to come back for, but like, it's not the case. So just test from one pass to the next, change what you put in there, change the price point and see what works best, you know? And I think if the change is meaningful enough, even though it's not an A-B test, you'll see the results quite clearly, I think, so. So maybe we can close off some of the questions. I, there are some questions coming in from chat. I was wondering, so this is more general. I was wondering if you guys are doing the series as a one-time thing or are you planning to do a series of different analysis moving forward as well? Well, I mean, you guys tell me if you guys like this. I personally like it. I'm I'm learning a lot from from these guys, from Giovanni and Alex, and I and I'm sure I'm gonna learn something from Jeff. So if you guys are interested in this, maybe we could do this once, I don't know, once a quarter or something on a different topic. Um, and then maybe one last question before we move on. Uh, okay, so would you start at a high price and then work down? I'd say yes. I mean. But I'd say yes, if you're like battle pass or not, I think you probably make things more manageable for yourself and you probably put yourself in a better position to succeed if you do that, so yeah. All right, great. Awesome.